and, and please introduce yourself when you make comments and questions. Hi, Andy, thank you for this presentation, very interesting. My name is Carlo Carugia, I work for the Jeff Independent Evaluation Office. Um, I was interested in knowing more, if you can elaborate more on why you don't need, you don't need access to participants. Uh, I suppose well, I, you hinted that you talk to the representatives of the participants, but uh, not necessarily, I mean, in my experience, that tells me that not always representatives represent. So how you yeah. get around that particular yeah. challenge? It is a challenge. Um, and uh, so bear in mind, first of all, we're dealing with chance systems, coupled human and natural systems. So it's a challenge in both systems. Uh, we always have this issue of uh, what, what is representative of the natural system and how do we get that. And what we have on the natural side is we have uh, different interests. We have uh, resource, natural resource users, whether they're fish harvesting or mining companies or recreational tourism, whitewater rafting, uh, recreational fishers. Then we have uh, environmental groups that have a variety of priorities and, and approaches. And then we have people who have stewardship responsibility for the environment, which are usually government organizations, but also really importantly, there's uh, the, uh, in Canada, and in, well, in North America, we would say that they're the original peoples over here, who have a separate and superior or senior stewardship responsibility for natural resources. So they all need to be involved, and they, they represent interest. So it's easier to understand from that perspective how we can go to groups, how we can go to interest, and then select who's, who's involved. Uh, usually when uh, a program or an intervention, let me say, is designed, there will have been consultations. And these, uh, the, those that are consulted will usually have uh, a relevant interest in the intervention, in, in the general terrain that the intervention works within and have expressed that interest in the design and are useful. They're knowledgeable about the terrain and about the, about the intervention. So they're useful representatives. Uh, I, there are other representatives that are there as part of the decision and the design process. They're not so useful. They're there because they might have an interest. Uh, so that, uh, say, we're, when we evaluated uh, off-road vehicles used in a national seashore on the east coast of the United States, there were 12 municipalities that were potentially involved, but eight of them didn't matter. They were just there because they were nosy, uh, and they thought that they might somehow be able to get something out of it. So we, we focused on the four. Uh, so we sort out the representatives that way, but there's, there's another uh, layer to your question is why don't we go to the affected people and the beneficiaries? I didn't ask that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a valid question. It's something that we do. And we can. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to. But there's no reason we can't. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we, uh, and we have, we have in one instance used uh, cell phone surveys to do that. Okay. Uh, it worked with modest success. Uh, uh, but the problem was in our capacity to design and implement cell phone surveys and the technology that we, we had access to. I think it's something that uh, is entirely viable. It's just that we don't have to have it. Whereas for the other methods, you absolutely have to have it. That's the difference. Thank you. Okay. Other Questions comments? Online? Is there somebody? A few questions online. Okay. Why don't you read them? So one, uh, one is a um, clarification from Jeremy uh, Topkis. I, um, he asks about the technical advisors and subject matter experts, how they should be selected, and what is the analysis and triangulation methods in case where uh, there is a respective opinion differ? How is, how is this analysis uh, mm -hmm. taking place? There are a few more questions. I don't know if you want them. Are they separate from those? Yes. <clears throat> How do we want to manage time? So, what, uh, why I don't you give I me a couple have, more? Yeah, yeah, I think we have time. So, so. we have Rachel uh, Newgarten from Conservation International. Is there some kind of guidance document for teams who wish to apply rapid impact assessment? Mm -hmm. Rebecca Urso uh, from Genesis Analytics in South Africa. 
We are doing some uh, work related to evaluation with the Green Fund, a catalytic fund for environmental projects. What makes this approach particularly suitable to evaluating innovation? For evaluating what? Innovation. 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 Uh, yes. yes. And uh, the question from Alan Amy. Have you ever gone through the process of evaluating a program with two groups, one with traditional design and the other with rapid impact evaluation? This might happen when two sponsors evaluate the same program. What has been the relative value of the two approaches? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there is one more. Brian <laughs> 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 uh, Arthur um, asks, I have a question. How can a rapid impact evaluation be used to bring project beneficiaries to be interested uh, in an evaluation of the project itself and then its results? In, in rural areas, it has not been uh, all the time that community members care about the evaluation we do. And I struggle with this aspect of stakeholder involvement. Does this, mean, uh, does this mean the project has failed to involve them, to make them understand uh, even what project is there for? Thanks. That, that kind of a, you know, and the mysterious comments that we have less than three people online. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're all great questions, and I can answer most of them, or I can address most of them. Uh, let me uh, let me say, uh, Jeremy, in terms of the analysis of triangulation, we'll deal with that in the second half. Uh, so we'll get to that. Uh, the technical advisors versus subject matter experts. I'll address that. But I'm going to address a couple of the other questions first. Uh, because I can go on for a long time about that, so I want to manage the time well. Uh, in terms of guidance documents, uh, we were just talking about this earlier. Um, the, the problem has uh, rapid impact evaluation is probably one of the few evaluation approaches that, were developed, that was developed by practitioners. And so we don't have a lot of time and resources to study our approach. We just do it, and the documentation is often constrained because we have clients who don't want to, uh, don't feel comfortable releasing the information, things like that. So, uh, but we're working on it. It's being piloted by the Treasury Board of Canada for inclusion under the National Evaluation Policy in Canada, uh, and uh, we're producing guidance documents as part of that, and. Uh, uh, particularly with the new government in Canada, I can assure you that they'll see the light of day and it won't be that long. Uh, and uh, and I, I think that uh, they're very much a work in progress, but, but they, they will help. Uh, I, have, uh, I have one of the worst websites on earth, uh, which is a depository for Dropbox documents, and nothing much more than that. And uh, I will commit to uh, creating a, a new a new file up there, uh, a new clickable thing, that will take you to, to what I have on, on the documents. And if Jeff wants, you can post that, uh, that, that stuff there too. Uh, but the guidance will, is forthcoming, uh, and uh, hopefully it will be useful. It's been very much a, uh, a learning effort for us working with people who are applying the method. It's the first time that anyone else has applied the method. So there's a lot of questions that come up that I hadn't realized were just part of the DNA of the developers of the method. Uh, applying the, related to this is the, Alan's question about applying the two approaches, the more traditional evaluation and the rapid, which we'd love to do. I'd actually like to apply a third one. I'd like to work with First Nations and use uh, Aboriginal knowledge and science as a third approach and actually work with all three approaches. Uh, because I, First of all, I think we can learn a lot. Secondly, I think it would be really interesting to do. Uh, and I think that the, uh, it's like uh, another level of triangulation, additional methods uh, that we could uh, really start getting an excellent assessment and improving our methods. So no, we haven't uh, yet done it where we can compare it. That's the type of thing that people in universities do. And if someone wants to do it, I'd be happy to have them join us. <coughs> Uh, evaluating, Rebecca, evaluating innovation, uh, particularly with the Green Fund. Um, the, this is uh, partly similar, somewhat similar to the 
the thing I raised about uh, um, addressing theories of change that really fundamentally deal with diffusion of innovation and adoption. Uh, that particular uh, program is converting transport fleets to LNG, liquid nat natural gas, uh, because it's more fuel efficient, less reliant on fo fossil fuels. And uh, of course, what we're after is a car carbon reduction. But we know what the carbon reduction is. If we know how many kilometers and how much idle time these fleets are running, and that's, that's just a simple output piece of data, then we know the carbon change. It's, it's a piece of cake. What, what's really at play in this program is, are the fleets going to adopt it? And are, are they going to adapt it? And are they going to use the technology? And uh, a lot of our stuff uh, in innovation really has to do with that. It has to do with finding ways to work with the private sector, with the NGO sector and other sectors, and get them to develop uh, scalable methods, scalable things that, uh, that can be used uh, that are more, more respectful and more efficient in their use of, of resources. So I think we can, uh, but we haven't done it, so I'm not positive, but I think we can. Uh, if we hadn't done the diffusion work uh, in Canada, I'd be more hesitant on this on this territory. <clears throat> um, the engaged beneficiaries. Uh, did I hear right uh, that the questioner is from Vanuatu? Well, let me assume the questioner is from Vanuatu because I understand exactly what, uh, or quite well, the the how difficult uh, it is uh, in uh, in settings like that. And uh, we're, uh, we're using a, a variant of rapid impact evaluation in Fiji uh, for uh, sustainable development, uh, coastal marine sustainable development, uh, food security livelihoods uh, uh, project. And it's actually a network. It's through, through the Pacific, but we're starting uh, this learning exercise in Fiji. And uh, the... Uh, uh, we're still in the process of modifying it. And this comes back to Jeremy's question about uh, 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 technical advisors and experts. And uh, to a certain extent, it has to do with uh, what are the interests in a community. So in a traditional Fijian community uh, where we have structures around clan, clan structures and, and tribes, then the the interests become quite interesting to work out. And we know that uh, in Fiji today, we have to engage uh, the clan leadership. We know we have to engage the pastor because the uh, uh, evangelical Christians are now quite important in a lot of Fiji, basically in Fijian communities. And they are importantly influential. So, and they have a very different interest than the clans. Uh, and we need to engage uh, uh, other interests. Uh, we have to engage women and children. We have to engage uh, vulnerable groups. And uh, my simple response is these are all different interests. Community, the community is not a single set of interests. There are multiple interests in the community, and those interests need to be engaged. And our premise is uh, is that by engaging them, as we would any other interest, that the evaluation starts addressing questions that are relevant to them, uh, that they'll regard the evaluation as more legitimate and as, as more credible, and therefore they'll be more open to using the evaluation results. Uh, and uh, right now that's a premise, because we're still in the middle of that, but things seem to be going okay. Uh, we've had some wrinkles that's taken nine months instead of two months to to progress as far as we have in the design process, but that's that's okay. Uh, so uh, I think the answer is that it's uh, I, we have the guidance from what we know about evaluation use, about science knowledge use, and it says go to the process, not the products. Engage all of the relevant interests in the process uh, right from the start, and do it jointly with them. And uh, too often we don't practice what we preach. We get uh, bogged down or 
sidetracked by logistics or difficulties or politics or agendas, and we, we don't really uh, do that as fully as we should. So that's my response, uh, and it's still a, a, also a, a work in progress. Uh, this issue of technical advisors and uh, subject matter experts always comes up. It always comes up at this point. It always comes up later. Uh, and we keep changing the names of the groups to try and make it more clear, and it's not, never become clear. Uh, and uh, it's possible that it means they aren't all that different, and so we should stop pretending we're triangulating, but I really think we are. So let me describe an actual case. Uh, we were looking at uh, five natural resource management, doing five natural resource management interventions in Oregon, in the Northwest of the United States, and they had to do with water and fish. And the, uh, the overlying, overarching thing was endangered species because the number of the salmon and trout species were endangered, and it's against the law to impair their, their existence. Uh, so uh, our technical advisors were uh, an emeritus faculty member from Oregon State, which is a good natural resource management university, who was an ecologist. Uh, and uh, he knew a lot about the fishery, about Oregon, uh, about water and water-based ecosystems and that sort of stuff. So he, he was, that's what our technical advisor looked like. And then he brought on uh, a, a grad student, actually a postdoc, who had worked for 15 years as a hydrologist before doing his PhD. So someone else who was really knowledgeable about some elements of the, of the science in which we were looking. Then we had the subject matter experts, who we used to call a science panel. Uh, and they included a hydrologist, a riparian zone, that's sort of the, the, near, the river banks, what the tree and vegetative growth on river banks. Uh, two hydrologists, actually, one on flow and temperature and one on seasonality. Uh, it included uh, uh, a fish habitat, a fisheries biologist, so quite about six sciences represented. And they went through different processes. The technical advisor, who was a candidate for sitting on the expert panel, but he, he, we wanted to have him work with us, worked with us throughout the evaluation. And he got to really know the interventions. He talked to the biologists who were uh, with the work for the tribes or who worked with the utilities uh, who were doing the, the stock assessments and all the assessment work leading up to the decisions. And he, he talked to the intervention people who were uh, negotiating and then uh, implementing the intervention. So he became thoroughly knowledgeable about the intervention. Our expert panel, we gave them a two-page briefing on each of the interventions. And they may have heard about them before, but our rule is they can't have had anything to do with them. They have to be not knowledgeable about the intervention because we want them to not be biased in, in any way uh, in favor or against the intervention. Uh, so they're easy to confuse if you were looking at them. If we all went out for dinner, as we did, you would have trouble telling them apart. Uh, but if you looked at, if you listened to them doing the assessment, the technical advisor talked about the intervention a lot. The science panel talked about subject matter experts, talked about the science a lot. And so it's more of a, it's the way we use them, uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's the way we engage them in the evaluation that differentiates them. It's not their DNA that is different. Hey, Chris, a clarification question. When you say that they can't be known about the intervention, you mean that specific project intervention, not the type of intervention that no. in general? No. No. The specific one. So uh, we didn't want anyone who had worked in the Deschutes River okay. uh, fish passage world uh, because, first of all, they all hate each other. <laughs> but it's just, uh, you know, they would carry a bunch of baggage with them, a bunch of biases. But they will know about, certainly about the science, they'll know about the general thing. But the other thing we're avoiding is the fly in expert. I mean, I, do a lot of housing. I used to do a lot of cell phone housing too, and we're always having these uh, experts come in for three weeks to 
uh, evaluate our project, and we knew from the outset that they were coming in and tell us it was a terrible project because we didn't use their method, or it was a really good project because we used their method. And, you know, it was we were avoiding those people too. Yeah, please. Just a quick question. So I'm interested. Uh, my name is Lulu Ali, and I work for the Jeffrey Good Barrier. Chemicals and waste issues. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is nothing to do with chemicals and waste. It's um, on the outcome of this evaluation, what are the assessments to put more emphasis on the qualitative uh, rather than quantitative, or, or vice versa? Or how do the evaluation at the end uh, capture both aspects of those elements? So, um uh, my bias, I, I obviously have bias. I'm an economist and I like numbers. I'm like many economists, I'm slightly dyslexic with numbers and careless with decimals, but I really feel comfortable with numbers. So most of the stuff we convert to scales. And whether that is a qualitative or a quantitative measure is something we, we're, we're sort of ambiguous about in evaluation. Uh, but the, you know, what it does is allow us to create indices of change, which allows us to tell about the expected percentage change in a direct effect, say a percentage change in water quality and flow, or a percentage change in impacts in the salmon population. Uh, so that uh, uh, we generally, I think most of the, uh, uh, the assessments that come out of rapid impact evaluation are almost uh, are numeric, they're scalar on an index, and expressed in a figure of some kind of graphical change or a range. There is a small point, though, is that we, we say, uh, because we're using these three groups, we don't try and get an average between the three groups, uh, because we just say they have three knowledges, and we don't know uh, which would be most right, but we, uh, what we're after is that they will bracket the range of, of likely results that will uh, that this project or this, this intervention will will lead to. So we talk about 15 to 30 percent or uh, 12 to 18 percent change in a particular effect, etc. That holds true when we talk about uh, when we go into cost effectiveness. Uh, we often reduce it to person years, change in person years, uh, to look at the efficiency or effectiveness of the intervention. Uh, or uh, or costs. Uh, so most of our most of our results tend to be fairly numeric in, in their expression. Uh, we provide the qualitative stuff, but we lead with the numeric. So we have the figure, and then we uh, can help people understand the, uh, the complexity of the figure with some of the qualitative stuff. And what we find is that we get a lot of really useful qualitative information from particular interests. And it's, there's not any particular interest universally. Sometimes in one evaluation, uh, the state government will have a wealth of, of knowledge about it that they want to communicate, or an environmental NGO will be, wants to communicate to us the importance of certain, certain direct effects, how they link and communicate to the rest of the natural system so that they're important not just for what we're evaluating but for the whole ecosystem. So that, that's really valuable and that's, that's sort of, we provide that as context to help people understand how to interpret things. Um, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. My name is yeah. from IEG of the World Bank. Um, I think the essence of the impact evaluation is the comparison between factual and counterfactual. Yeah. So I'm just curious, how do you set counterfactual in this method, and how do you compare that? I'm going to do them in the second half. The first thing I'm going to do is that. Okay, that's right. Okay. Uh, and I'll be very interested in yeah, everyone's comments on that, yours, because it's, uh, I find it quite exciting. Uh, it's quite neat. It's been quite liberating coming up. Hi, Shilpa Modi with the QED Group. Um, and I just had a question. You got a little bit into how you're analyzing the data from the expert groups. But I just wanted, if you could speak to a little bit, of what are your methods of data collection that you're actually doing with the expert groups? Okay. We, 
if I can address that, we use a facilitated workshop with the subject matter experts, uh, and I'll tell you what that looks like in a second. Uh, we use the web-based survey uh, generally with the program stakeholder group. Uh, we're not going to do that in Fiji, uh, but generally uh, we do. We do it wherever possible uh, because it's uh, it allows us. You know, you can go all kinds of routes, and you can just be more efficient and. Uh, it's easier, I find it easier to get reliability from a web-based survey than I do from uh, the other mechanisms we use. Uh, and the technical advisors, uh, one thing I didn't mention, the technical advisors have all the research reports going into the formation of the program too. They also complete a portion of the web-based survey. The web-based survey to the program stakeholder group is a really valuable vehicle to gather all kinds of other information addressing the other evaluation issues. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so it's, it's a great vehicle. And we get, uh, uh, I would say our lowest response rate is still over 70% and 100% of interest. Now it's because we're using a use inspired approach. So of course they're gonna respond because they're joint knowledge producers of the whole thing. So, uh, and we're not going to 10,000 uh, respondents. The most we've gone to is probably 80, I would say, in one case I can think of. Um, what the, what the uh, workshop looks like, uh, we're bringing in uh, these uh, subject matter experts. We don't want them to have had uh, a relationship to the actual thing we're evaluating. We also don't want them to be uh, uh, we don't want any risk that they're going to try and use this uh, thing to enhance their careers. So do we don't want them standing up and saying, my, my approach is the best, this is the way you have to do it, and blah, blah, blah. You know, the fly-in three-week housing expert. Uh, so we tend to, you know, they, they look sort of old, sort of often quite scruffy, uh, and, uh, uh, and very thoughtful. They often talk quite slowly, not fast talkers. They're thoughtful and they're talking. It just, this is what they always look like. I don't think I'm out seeking these people because I often don't see them. And we treat them well. We bring them in uh, and uh, we look for them to be in the same locale to reduce our cost. Uh, we bring them in and they start with breakfast and uh, that goes well. We have a facilitator so that we're not a source of bias in the, in the process. Uh, they have a two-page briefing that they had, which presumably they read in transport while getting to the to the meetings. Two page, uh, an expert group can usually handle about three different evaluations if they're on the same terrain in a day. Uh, they might have so they might have one, or they might have up to three. So they read the briefings, and we introduce the purpose, and we describe the each of the interventions in the process. And basically, it's a it's a process. It's a social process for methodology. Uh, modified a little bit, so we use flip charts, and we have flip charts there with each of the direct effects and the initials of each of the experts uh, under each of the different scales that we're judging these in, and I'll talk about why there's all these variables in there in a minute. And they go up and they use our rating scales. And they just walk around the room filling them in on the first intervention, then the second, then the third. And uh, we wait for them to finish, and when they sit down, the facilitator says, I notice that you've assigned this particular direct uh, effect of four, and you've assigned it a one. And that's quite a difference. Could you talk about this? Uh, tell us what your assumptions are. And what we're interested in is them articulating the assumptions that they use to give their ratings, because we're interested in reliability, and we want them to be addressing the same concept. We're not looking for them to reach consensus. We're quite happy with four and zero over two and three. It doesn't matter to us. But we just need to be sure that they're understanding the concept in the same way. So if it's water quality in this river for this range, that's what they need to be addressing. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what the, the, that group looks like and what, what the various information got in. in the, at the outset, we have interviews with all of the members of the program stakeholder group. And we try and most we've worked with is about 20. Uh, we, a lot of our evaluations, we've done these as telephone interviews. And that's, uh, but not all of them. We've done it that way because of the nature of the cases. These are environmental disputes. 
So to get the lead attorney from General Electric to come to Washington to uh, spend a, a, a day with us or some time, that's impossible. We'll get 15 minutes of her time. So that's, that's all we have, and we'll do it in a very efficient telephone interview. Yes. I have still a couple of people here in the room. I don't know if we have any. Yes, we have a few more questions online. Okay, so uh, Dennis. Yeah, um, <coughs> Dennis of the Jeff Evaluation Office. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, you talked about the unintended beneficiaries, mm -hmm. uh, like poachers, but poachers is a, is a quite obvious one. Um, how, how do you capture them in this process? Yeah. Do you have anything related online here? Or? No. No. no, it's more about philosophy, I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Carlo, did you say, want no, to I say? No, it's already been answered by previous questions, so I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Because we have to move pretty soon sure, to sure. the next phase. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, as you know, that's not always easy. Poachers are easy. Uh, and they're also something we talked about before this session. So it's on the top of my mind. Uh, they emerge. One of the things we do uh, is we start with, so we will go and well, our first conversation will be with the intervention, whoever is there, the, the core of the intervention. We'll understand it and we'll ask them. And we'll keep asking them because they always start, well, this is what we intend. And I say, well, who else is affected? So if, you, if you've got a dam and you're going to, and it's blocking salmon coming up, if you breach the dam, let the water out, uh, and a bunch of people have built cabins around the lake, there are going to be 200 meters of mudslides between them and, the, and what's left of the river. So in discussing things, these things tend to emerge to a certain extent, but not, reliable, not reliably, so you can count them. Uh, then we go to the literature, and uh, we actually find quite often uh, that within social media, there's a bunch of people voicing opinions about these things that uh, are not normally not part of the formal structure, but some of them actually represent something. So when we are evaluating off-road vehicle use, they're active social media users and bizarre social media users. And we actually found that there were subgroups within off-road vehicle. There were categories of off-road, there were hierarchies and structures, and we had to uh, and that the organizations have been captured by some of these, but not by all of these. So we had to uh, basically expand and listen to those. At the same time, we were kicking out some of the municipalities that really didn't have a valid voice. And uh, it's interesting and important what you do with uh, uh, natural resources, because there are well, let me stay with uh, off-road vehicle use. So national seashores, basically, typically will have a whole bunch of sand dunes. So they'll have a lighthouse. They'll have some communities nearby. They'll have some endangered species because everywhere there's endangered species. So they'll be there. But they'll have other stuff. Like if you allow vehicles to drive on the sand dunes and on the, the shores, the tidal shores, then you're ruining the food for all kinds for the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, you're compressing the sand so the worms can't be there. And, you know, you're just, you're messing up that whole ecosystem. So who's going to give voice to that stuff? And it's, uh, it's what you, what we do with that, and it, there's perhaps better ways, but we just really get naggy. It's almost, I can see in people's eyes, they think, they start thinking of me like a, a two-year-old, always asking why, why do we do that? But, I really want to pursue them until I've exhausted them. I think that's the only answer. And, uh, but it's something you really have to tend to. Thanks very much. Uh, Gita, can you, are you able to read those questions from there? Um, I guess there's a question on trade-offs. Um, RIEs present an approximate answer to a given research question. How have the donors taken this product so far? Um, as it presents, a tra does it present a good trade-off of cost versus speed? I think many of the questions are related to your next round, so. Yeah, although that one really has, that one I could deal with mm -hmm. here, I think. Okay. Uh, so I gave you the example of the PT, uh, I think, no, maybe I didn't. So that was, the donors thought it was a conservation project. 
conservation program is throughout the Pacific, around 600 sites, about somewhere between 250 and 400, depending on how you count them in Fiji, pretty well the coastline of Fiji. The donors thought that they were funding a conservation project. They were the MacArthur Foundation and the Packard Foundation. Uh, the country people in Indonesia and Fiji and uh, Palau and other places uh, were doing food security and livelihoods uh, using community development models, different community development models. Uh, and, uh, and usually a no take on some kind of green protected area that would be enforced at the, at the community level. And I raise this example because the first thing we did was uh, push back to the donors and saying, you're wrong, it's not a conservation project. And they got angry uh, and talked about cutting funding or actually their representatives started talking about, well, let's not just tell them that. Let's just deal with these other things. Uh, and really, uh, and that's part of the dialogue sometimes you have with, with the donors is when you that uh, their concept of the theory of change or what, what the program is about, when you're dealing with uh, coupled human and natural systems, when you're dealing with complex settings with multiple moving parts and systems, even within one human system engaging together, uh, the, the interventions are more complex and the donors need to be able to hear, uh, actively listen to a story that is much richer than the story they thought they were going to have. And that's the solution. You pitch them a richer story. You're getting a lot more for what you're doing than what you thought you were doing. Uh, and you're getting conservation that's happening. It should be happening. Don't worry about it. Let's, we'll look at that. Don't worry about it. So, uh, but I really don't, aside from the donors, within the interests that are involved in the intervention, I don't find a trade off. Uh, it might be that the environmental groups and the utility don't like each other. Uh, but our process is agnostic about both. Both have to be engaged and the other interests are engaged and we want it to be salient, legitimate and credible to all the groups, to all the interests that are involved without prioritizing any. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, so it's quarter past. Uh, now, so why don't we go to your second part and save these, the rest of the questions um, until after that. Um, I'm afraid we only have about five minutes uh, left. Uh, uh, so uh, can we first see whether those uh, questions that were posted online earlier, whether they have been answered by the presentation already or mm -hmm. are there still additional points? Yes. Some of them have been answered. Uh, in general, uh, there, is a question, uh, there are questions about um, trade-offs between cost and speed uh, that was posed by IFAD and cost versus accuracy. Um, then there was a question about um, is this approach uh, equally applicable when the evaluation purpose is accountability as opposed to learning? And another question is, how do you attribute the impact to a particular intervention if there are other interventions going in parallel? And we've got the counterfactual yeah. 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 question mm -hmm. that you asked. And is that, do you want to follow up on that question again? Um, maybe later. <laughs> yeah, I'll be confused. Okay. And there was a question from uh, our colleague, Aaron Rosetta, uh, about cost and time. Yeah. Okay, so there was, I stopped, stopped taking up, there was a, the previous question was a mix with, it was after accountability versus learning. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a mix with what? If there are other interventions, how do you know? Yeah, there is, yeah, there are well, uh, other, other, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, there isn't really uh, uh, a speed cost, speed is the right word. Uh, that's a good word. Uh, there isn't really a trade-off uh, because most of the expenditure goes on engaging and working with the program stakeholder group. And we actually spend roughly three quarters of our resources uh, in that consultation process and designing the evaluation and getting them all on site with what we call 
And if you think about it, what we do for information gathering is a couple of web surveys that uh, facilitate a group process, so they're not very expensive or time consuming. And the analysis is relatively easy. You do it in Excel uh, with no complex stuff to do. Uh, so uh, a bunch of your resources go up, up front, and you can't rush that. Uh, you, you need to time things so that people have time to work with you. But if they need more time, you have to spend more time. Uh, and that's just, that's just what has to happen. You need them uh, at, uh, as part of the process uh, evaluation uh, for the two reasons. One, as I've said, they're going to provide you with lots of information, whether it's unintended beneficiaries or uh, all kinds of other things uh, that you need to uh, uh, engage with and bring in, and that it brings them onto the evaluation. Same with cost versus accuracy. Uh, uh, expert judgment has uh, has uh, uh, limitations in terms of not so much accuracy but precision. Uh, it, uh, expert judgment is, a, is an estimating process. Uh, Delphi methods are estimating processes. We have a literature on expert judgments. It's not great, but it, it's clear that's what we're doing. We're estimating. And uh, I think the, the issue is whether we respect and are transparent about that uh, instead of pretending that we're any kind of false precision or anything to it. There is, uh, uh, but the same thing to, to consider is that precision is usually uh, the territory of the methodologists. And uh, decision makers, if you know your decision makers and you know your, their bandwidth for what they need, uh, then I don't think you're going to have any trouble meeting that bandwidth with rapid impact evaluation. Uh, you might have trouble publishing it in some peer reviewed journals. Uh, uh, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, we know that decision makers make judgments in absence of information. Uh, and uh, that they generally welcome some information. And if we can tell them that you're going to change, uh, you're going to improve conditions for salmon reproduction uh, by somewhere between 12 to 18 percent in this river, they'll say, okay, that's worth continuing for those. And they'll ask about the upper bound, and we might say, well, the most we've seen is 25, so you're doing quite well. You know, that's the discussion. That's the nature of dialogue. So I don't think there is a cost versus accuracy because I don't think uh, – uh, I think the accuracy issue is do we get the sign right and are we roughly right in terms of magnitude? And I think we are. That's why we do all this triangulation, that sort of stuff. Accountability versus learning, absolutely. Uh, evaluation is faced with that trade off all the time. Uh, we're doing use inspired, so we're into learning. And we provide cost effectiveness. We hope to get to return on investment, so we contribute to accountability. Uh, I just want to deal with one other, which is the mix with other influences. We have to specify some of these things. Uh, uh, and uh, so we often say that uh, in, when we're particularly when we're describing the counterfactual and when we're describing the intervention, We'll, we'll actually talk about what the other influences are, and we'll say whether they'll continue at the same order or whether they'll be changed. So we're asking people to consider those when they're making the judgment. My final comment on that and for the whole thing is that I have learned against my, uh, uh, unwillingly learned that the human being is a better microprocessor of complex things than we can write the code for. And so I now have a fair amount of confidence in the use of expert judgments or people synthesizing these external forces into the judgments they do. They prioritize them differently. So in the expert group, when you have zero and you have a four, we want you to talk about it because chances are it's going to be those external forces here that you're not assuming the same way and we'll try and get you to do it. But beyond that, uh, I have confidence that we, we're getting reasonably reliable and valid uh, estimates out of, out of our problems. Yeah, I just thank you for this interesting presentation. I just had one question. Have you had a chance to go back 
um, to actually look at whether these low-end and high-end estimates have panned out, more in the interest of learning whether this methodology is, is a viable one. Uh, we have four evaluations we did, uh, two of which we had Two, yes, two, three of which we had data for. They were all salmon and trout. And uh, we had the advantage that the intervention, some of these interventions were done in the early 2000s, late 1990s. So the salmon, they had their life cycle at sea and a chance to return. We still have all the other effects going on. So let me say that our, our forecast uh, aligned reasonably well with the, the counts that were done of returning salmon. That's all we can say. We can't say that they're the same because there's too many forces at play. But they're, they're within the same, same ballpark. When we took them and a lot of our other estimates back to the, some of the people representing some of the interests, they felt they uh, felt we did that once after the evaluations, about a year after, and then we did it. Uh, I, I happened to be in Portland, so I took a couple of days to go talk to these people. Uh, and uh, and they still felt that it was the evaluations gave a, uh, a quite a reasonable picture of the undertaking. And uh, unfortunately, in those evaluations, it included some information that's really important for people to know that we can't communicate. Uh, but I had the opportunity to say, so our estimates on that stuff we couldn't talk about to anyone else, but you know, did that turn out the way we thought it was? And they said yes. It actually did. So uh, we've had opportunities. And then when the one case where we had the bad information, uh, we had data from there, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't good to use it because they weren't making valid estimates of the returning sample. 